understanding as we hear now the reading of God's law from Exodus 20. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those that hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or even the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, or you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, we come to the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Of all the commandments in the ten, this is probably the most well-known. For one, it seems to be the commandment that everyone kind of naturally accepts. Nobody has a problem with the command, you shall not murder. Every culture around the world believes it's wrong. The only problem is, is that we define murder differently. Cannibalistic tribes believe murder is wrong, but then they define murder as killing somebody who's in your own clan. Those guys from the other tribe, oh, we can kill and eat them. Despotic and tyrannical regimes around the world may prosecute murder from the citizens, but as the state, well, they can kill the enemies of the state with impunity. Eradicating them is a service to society, a necessary evil in pursuit of the greater good. To the Nazis and other genocidal governments, there are ethnic groups that are detestable, that we define as less than human. To kill those people groups is protecting the best interests of the nation and killing cockroaches. This is to say that how we interpret the Sixth Commandment and how we define murder makes all the difference in the world. It distinguishes a civilized culture from a barbaric culture. It separates a culture of life from a culture of death. Definitions matter. Definitions matter, and that means that translations matter too. That brings us to the text of the Sixth Commandment. If you memorized the Ten Commandments in the Old King James, then you know this commandment as thou shalt not kill. The ESV says you shall not murder. Now, let me ask you, what difference does that make? Does that translation make any difference at all? That brings us to the first point. What does the Bible mean by murder? The words murder and kill don't mean the same thing, do they? Murder brings to mind a precise category of killing. It involves intentionality, maybe premeditation, 
And it involves people. You can't murder a cow. You can't murder a houseplant. You can't murder a cat. You can kill all those things. You can be cruel, but it's still not murder. Killing is a much broader word and can be done to a lot of things. So the question is, does God not want us to kill or does God not want us to murder? You see the problem, don't you? Because if God doesn't want us to kill, then God is terribly inconsistent because God kills lots of people. And the Bible is filled with stories of God commanding killing. God commands the death penalty. God commands warfare. God commands the outright genocidal eradication of the Canaanites. As a spiritual jihad. Is God inconsistent? Is God speaking out of two sides of his mouth? Uh, this, This misunderstanding of the sixth commandment, as thou shalt not kill, is one of the leading objections to your armchair atheist. God says, thou shalt not kill. But then how can you say all of these things? The Bible's terribly inconsistent. How are we to resolve this problem? Well, let's consider the Hebrew. And I won't give you the Hebrew word. But the word we translate as murder in the ESV means to cause someone's death unjustly. It's used exclusively to describe a human taking another person's life in an unnecessary and an unjust manner. As such, the word for murder is never used in the Bible associated with capital punishment or killing in warfare. Phil Riken says it applies to murder in cold blood, to manslaughter with passionate rage, and negligent homicide resulting from recklessness or carelessness. Expanding that list, Joachim Dalma describes the following four scenarios that fall under the Hebrew word for murder. And the first is what we call murder. Murder in the first degree is an intentional murder that you've planned out ahead of time. You know what you want to do, and you have a plan to do it. Now, without premeditation, in other words, I I don't have a plan. I haven't been planning on killing you. But still with intent, I want to kill you. We call that murder in the second degree. Now, these are categories, these are situations where we intentionally take someone's life when we know it's wrong. Our criminal justice system recognizes that. The second scenario is what our criminal justice system today would call voluntary manslaughter. When you assault someone without the intention of killing them, but they die from their injuries, the Bible calls this murder. Think of the mugger, a robber who stabs someone in the back or in the gut. All they want is to take their money. All they wanted was to wound, but if the man dies from his wounds, then that robber has murdered that man. The third scenario is what we categorize as involuntary manslaughter or reckless homicide. This occurs when, whenever personal recklessness causes someone's death. A driver who runs a red light or drives drunk certainly isn't intending to kill another person. But if you strike a pedestrian when you run a red light or you're driving drunk and you kill them, you have murdered them. Not because of your intent, but because of your recklessness. That person's death was unfair and unjust and you're responsible. 
The fourth scenario occurs when there's no apparent culpability, but there is what we might call moral liability. This occurs when your carelessness or your recklessness inadvertently, passively causes someone's death. According to Scripture, you were liable if you were swinging an axe and the axe head flies off and kills somebody. If you failed to build a railing around the rooftop pavilion of your home and someone fell to their death, that too brought moral liability. It was considered murder. The same is true of a dangerous animal. If an ox gored and killed a man after being known to be aggressive or territorial, then the man was liable for murder because he did not restrain and tie up his ox. We might call this negligent manslaughter. At issue here is not your intent to harm life, but your lack of effort to protect life. I'll say that again. In this last category, we see the command, you shall not murder, and applies not only to the intent to harm life, but also any lack of effort to protect life. In the last sense, the sixth commandment requires not merely refraining from doing harm. It's requiring that you exercise due diligence to prevent harm by tightening your axe head before going to work, by building railings around your rooftop pavilions and your balconies, around wells that kids or animals might fall into. It means securing or putting down dangerous animals, we might say a dog. I hope you can see that, that based on this definition, God does not outright forbid all forms of killing. He forbids unjust killing, unfair killing, which includes reckless disregard for life. By contrast, there are forms of killing that are justified. It's not simply the case that killing is killing and killing is wrong. More on that in a moment. But now we move on to the second point. Why is murder wrong? Why is murder wrong? Is is murder wrong because all life is sacred? Is Is it wrong because man's life has worth? He has something to offer society? Are we to have a broad and general reverence for life? Not according to Scripture. Now, Scripture does teach us that we ought to have a respect for the dignity of life, and we believe in the dignity of human life But we do not believe that human life by itself is sacred. Why not? Because God is the one who is sacred. The reason we respect man's life is not found in man, it's found in God. Because God made man in his image. Murder is wrong not because of what man is, but because of who God is. It's precisely because God has placed his image on man. Not purely as a mental ability. Reason isn't the image of God. The ability to think and reason at a level above the animals, that's not in itself the image of God. It's it's not that we are capable of having a relationship with God that the animals don't have. That makes us the image of God. No, the image of God is a status that God has given us. And our reason, our relational ability, our spiritual ability, all these things are abilities that God has given us so that we can execute the status he's given us. He has placed dignity and honor on mankind. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man? If for a little while you've made him a little lower than the sons of God, the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. 
If we fear God, then we will honor His image. I mentioned in our discussion of the second commandment that one of the reasons that God does not want to be worshipped through man-made images is because He's already given us an image of Himself through which we worship Him. And that image is the image of God held by our neighbor. We find this link between the image of God and respecting and honoring other human beings in Genesis 9-6. This verse lays the foundation of our understanding of civil government and of the death penalty as Christians. There we read, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. According to this verse, why does God want us to execute the murderer? Is it to give justice to the family? Is it to prevent further further murders? Does it do anything to undo a murder? If you kill the person who kills somebody else, what does that do for the person who's dead? I can't undo it. No. God says, I want you to kill murderers because they struck out against me. It's because God made man in his image and no other reason. Yes, the death penalty does have a capacity to deter murder, but that's not why it's commanded. God says, if you strike at me, I'm coming to get you. And I'm sending lawful authority after you to get you. The man who unjustly kills another doesn't deserve jail time. He does not need rehabilitation. He deserves to die because he struck down the image of God. Now consider also that God is the God who gives life. All life comes from God. And as the giver of life, God alone has the authority, the right, to take life from human beings. We can't take that right upon ourselves. Murder is wrong in part and, and secondarily because it is taking a life that God has not commanded us to take. God alone has the prerogative of giving life and taking life. And when we take life without his permission, outside of the boundaries that he has said, this is when you must do it, again, we're disrespecting God's authority as the author of life. To that effect, justice sometimes demands death. Protecting life sometimes requires taking life. The Bible gives examples of protecting the family and property from an invader in the night, of waging war, of executing capital punishment. In the Bible, none of these things are qualified as murder. In fact, the sixth commandment not only safeguards, but it makes absolutely necessary things like the death penalty, which we've already said. But that leads in turn to just war theory. Self-defense and castle doctrines. You have a reasonable right in the sixth commandment itself to protect your own life and the life of your people and even your property. Now, a major caveat here is that God does not give us the right to execute vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Again, His is the authority there to take life. We cannot execute the death penalty as individuals any more than we can declare war on Russia as individuals. The sword belongs to the state, As Romans 13 says, For he, the authority, the civil authority, is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. We are not to exercise 
bloody vengeance or go to war ourselves because we are not entrusted with that authority. This goes back to the fifth commandment. But God has ordained civil authorities for precisely that purpose. Likewise, God does not give us the right to use deadly force when it's reasonably possible to bring an end to a bad situation without causing death. So, in, in the issue of castle doctrine, protecting your property and your family from a robber or thief, the Israelite was not liable if he killed a, mur- a robber in the night. But if he killed a robber in the daytime, he was liable. Why? Well, it's comparable to shooting a burglar in the back. If somebody with a gun or a knife is running at you and threatening your life, you can protect yourself and take his life. If somebody with a gun or a knife is running the other way and you shoot him while he's fleeing, your life's not in danger. You're getting vengeance, and that's murder. It's the same principle here. When we lose sight of these facts, that that the life of man has superior worth because he's made in God's image, and God alone has the right to take life, and he sets our boundaries for taking life, then bad things are uh, are bound to happen. There's a reason that the past hundred years have been among the bloodiest, no, categorically, the bloodiest in human history. People like to complain, atheists like to complain about the bloody wars of religion. But the bloody wars of atheism are a lot worse. The bloody wars of Darwinistic naturalism, the life taken as a result of secularism, is a lot worse. Under Darwinistic and naturalistic worldviews, man's worth, after all, is reduced to his utility, what he has to offer society. Man becomes then a thing to be used and disposed of. And so the modern man evaluates life based on what an individual can provide society, what a child can provide for me as a mother or father? Will a child add to my life or take away from my life rather than anything intrinsic to him or her? In the modern world, a human being is nothing before they're born and they're nothing when they're old and infirm and taking resources and time and medicine. The same worldview allows for, embraces abortion and infanticide as it does euthanasia and doctor-assisted suicide. And if evolutionary thought is embraced along with it, if there are less evolved strains of humanity, then that means we can eradicate those weaker strains in order to make room for the strong. We embrace an ethic of the survival of the fittest. And we kill the unfit. This is the cruel calculus of a view of man that does not believe that God made him. And that God does not place any sort of dignity or status on man. But if man is made in God's image, he has dignity and worth, and he is to be cherished apart from what he can offer society, whatever costs he brings. The children are to be viewed not as an expense or an inconvenience, but a blessing from the Lord, even if they come into this world with disabilities. Even if they come into this world with an expectation that they might live two or three years. They're still worth it because they're still image bearers of God. And when people are old, and they're crotchety and a pain to work with, or they're on a ventilator in a vegetative state, they still have worth. They're still the image of God. And we have the privilege of caring for them because in caring for those who bear God's image and can do nothing for us, we 
honor God himself. When we bring human life into the world, we worship God and we multiply his image. We fulfill our basic mission in Genesis. And when we respect the aged and the dying, we're respecting God and cherishing the life that he has given us. Uh, As an aside, this is not to say that we are obligated to make sure a life lasts as long as medically possible because there is a difference between terminating life and terminating treatment. To let a person die, to let your own cancer take its course, that's not murder. If all that's keeping a person alive is the ventilator and the feeding tube, it's not wrong to take them off. But remember, it is God who has the authority to take life. We're not called to take the life of the elderly. But because we live in a world with death, we must allow death to happen when God's time comes. Third point, the sixth commandment requires us to protect and to preserve life. We call this the two-sided rule. It goes like this. Where a sin is forbidden, the corresponding duty is required. And where a duty is required, the corresponding sin is forbidden. This means there's a flip side to every commandment. And if the commandment not to murder has a flip side, then that means we should protect and preserve life. The Heidelberg Catechism says the Sixth Commandment requires us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to be patient, peace-loving, gentle, merciful, and friendly to them, to protect them from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. Christians, it's not good enough for you to simply refrain from killing people. That's no great achievement. Most people go through their lives without killing somebody. You must actively seek to protect the lives of those around you. Now, how do you do that? I don't know. How can you do that? How has God equipped you to protect and preserve the lives of the people around you? What resources has God given you to do this? I think it simply begins with our perspective. We can't commit to protect and preserve life if our eyes are focused on ourselves. We have to take our eyes off of ourselves and pay attention to the people around us. We cannot seek the good of our neighbors if we don't know our neighbors, if we don't pay attention to them. I'm going to ask you, what do your neighbors, I just mean the people on your street, what do your neighbors need from you? What do your coworkers need from you? How can you improve their lives? How can you help protect and preserve their lives? How can you bless their lives? If you don't know them, you don't know. It also means that we pay attention to our environment. You might say that the sixth commandment serves as something of a spiritual OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Applying the sixth commandment to the workplace and to the home safety is an essential aspect of honoring the Sixth Commandment. It's an essential aspect of being a Christian homeowner, an employer. Too often we we treat the issue of workplace safety as simply a question of avoiding being sued. But God's not primarily concerned about your civil liability here. He's concerned about your spiritual liability, your moral liability You have a moral liability to God for the safety working environments of your home and workplace and how you drive. Think again of fences around rooftops, of oxen and dogs attacking. Think of vehicle and chainsaw maintenance. 
We can't make the world perfectly safe. That's not what God's calling us to. People will do stupid and dangerous things, and they will kill themselves accidentally. But as far as we're able, we should put structures in place and perform maintenance to preserve life and to prevent needless injury. I also think you can make a strong argument based on the Sixth Commandment for self-defense, for handgun training. While Scripture would condemn using those skills to needlessly cause harm to others, I think every man should have some capacity to protect himself and to protect his family. If as the protector of the home, you can't even protect yourself, what are you going to do? Something as simple as carrying a knife could be in obedience to the Sixth Commandment. At the very least, I'll say that if you own a gun and you fail to discipline yourself in using it, if you're not mentally prepared to use it in a scenario, if you fail to keep it in a safe location, if you fail to teach your family and your kids gun safety, then you're in breach of the Sixth Commandment. You're risking injury and harm to your children, to yourself, to your wife, to your husband and others if you don't secure your weapons, if you don't train in them and teach your family gun safety. That's all there is to it. Now, before we conclude, I want to remind you what Jesus says about the Sixth Commandment. And it gets to the heart. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool, you idiot, will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't come out too well on that front. In this passage, Jesus teaches us that the sixth commandment addresses the heart. We might call this the inside-out rule. It applies to your thought life and your emotions, the things you say and the things you do. The sixth commandment condemns a heart that hates and words that kill just as it does murdering somebody with a gun or a knife. Anger, insults, hatred, even calling someone an idiot are ways we break this commandment. Paul mentions enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. There are ways, after all, that we can kill that cut deeper than any knife. We do it with words. We do it with our demeanor. We've all heard the saying, we've all said it ourselves, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, that ain't true, is it? I've broken bones that healed. I'm still carrying the wounds of people who said some things to me. We say, if looks could kill. Well, looks can kill just as much as a word can. A look of displeasure, a look of hatred, a look of rejection. So Proverbs 18, 14 says, a man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear? We've all experienced being crushed in spirit because of something somebody said or something somebody did or, or looked at us. We have a responsibility not just to physical life in this sense, but also to spiritual life to the inner life of the soul. It means we also have a responsibility to eternal life. That's a different sermon. But everything that we've said about murder, about recklessness, about our duty to protect and preserve life, and not only applies to the external world, but also to the internal world, to the relational world. If we are filled with hearts of hate and resentment, if we cherish the thought of something ha terrible happening to a teacher or to a boss or to a president, then we are murderers at heart. And though while we, may, we might not be criminally liable in the civil justice system, we are morally liable in the heavenly justice system. We can all think of people whose death, if we are honest with ourselves, would make our lives easier. 
And that thought is a revelation that we would rather them be dead. Which is we'd rather murder them, just not directly. For each of us, as we see the extent to which the sixth commandment applies, we must realize that we've all broken us, broken it. None of us escape the sixth commandment. But as we end, I want to speak directly to those of you who really have broken it. And you know it. If you've had an abortion, or you've made your girlfriend or daughter have an abortion, if you were or are a bully, a violent man, physically abusive, a violent criminal, a drug dealer, if you are directly responsible for someone's death, maybe you even shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. I want you to hear this. Remember that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, not the righteous. He forgives and he cleanses from even murder, even unintentional murder. Jesus is the ultimate life giver. And in his beautiful, ironic plan of redemption, the way he gives us life and saves our life is by sacrificing his own. He was murdered to pay for your murder. His death was offered in place of your own. You see, it doesn't matter how big or how small you've broken this commandment, whether only in thought or in word or in big ways. The way to salvation, however you've broken it, is through Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross. Substitutionary, that means substitute. Jesus bore the capital punishment the death sentence from God's courtroom. He bore that death penalty in your place. The punishment you deserve for defacing, destroying the image of God, your blood guilt, he took upon himself. And in its place, he gives you the pure white garments of his righteousness. All you have to do is receive it by faith to clothe yourselves in Christ. You must believe that Jesus really does forgive your sins and cleanse you from your guilt because only his blood can wash the blood from our hands. So as we close, are you washed in that blood? For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let's pray.